In this sacred season, our thoughts certainly turn to the significance of our spiritual convictions as a strength and value in daily living. We remember how men have fought for their beliefs, have struggled for the rights of spiritual strength, just as they have struggled for the right of economic or political liberty. We also realize that from the earliest time, religion has not only been a dominant force in the life of people, it has also been under almost constant persecution in some form or other. In ages of disbelief or unbelief, it was persecuted by those seeking to discredit its values. In other periods, religion persecuted religion. The faiths of men were locked in a terrible struggle for the dominance of theological concepts. Yet through all this diversified tribulation, faith has still remained the most powerful force in the life of the human being. And we are quite ready to believe that to the degree that man loses faith, to that degree he loses security and strength in all of the projects of his living. In times of great prosperity, men drift away from the sense of need. But in adversity of one kind or another, they return, constantly aware that life without faith is weak in its core, lacking the securities and supports that are necessary for fullness of expression. We would think, therefore, that recognizing the essential value involved, we would either make a greater and more thorough study of our religious conviction, or else we would try more assiduously uh, to apply it to the various needs of life. In this day, which is burdened so heavily with material problems, the time of nominal religion has passed, at least for this generation. Belief either must sustain or else it must be acknowledged as valueless to ourselves. There is no point whatever in a mild, non-utilitarian approach to faith. Either we need it and must use it, or else it is meaningless to us. We therefore watch people constantly, and we observe that religious ignorance is comparatively rare. There are very few persons who have not some concept of the value of spiritual fact. Yet the ability to apply these spiritual overtones to the immediate problem of the day remains terribly undeveloped. We are still not securing the strength of our faith. And we look around to try and find out why we live upon the surface of a spiritual conviction which, did we live it more completely, would sustain us more completely through every decision that we have to make in daily conduct. And we cannot come to any conclusion but one, namely that the human being has not yet found the way to apply ideals directly to his own conduct. He can see why they should be applied. He can be almost envious of those who seem to be able 
to apply. He wishes that he could derive strength from conviction. And he probably feels that he does gain some strength. But in emergency, it is seldom totally sufficient. The need, therefore, for a more active, a more secure state of faith exists all over the world. And not only among those of simple beliefs, but among the most advanced of the students of various specialized religious and philosophical systems. The need to put these values immediately to work is a pressing need. Perhaps the answer to this problem lies in the fact that religion, as a subject of study, as a basic value, may be termed a contemplative art. The individual who, has, who is unable to contemplate values will have great difficulty in using his religion. Religion cannot be merely an immediate affirmation followed by a full expression of application. Religion begins as a gradual enriching of the internal life of the person. And this enriching depends upon a contemplative procedure. Uh, not long ago, one of our prominent educators pointed out that our word learning comes from an old Greek word which means leisure. Now that is one of the things that we have lost sight of. To us, learning is a frantic process. To us, living is a frantic process. And getting rich is the most frantic process of all. We are living, therefore, in a perpetual frenzy. We are either overwhelmingly busy doing what? No one seems to know. Or else we are overwhelmingly unoccupied. Doing nothing so continuously that we are bored to distraction. But even in doing nothing, we proceed frantically. We do not accomplish negation gracefully, but with the same terrible insistency with which we do everything else. And because of the momentum, this peculiar vibratory pressure that is on us continuously, we waste more time than any other people in history. We waste by haste. We waste by overpressure. And we have come to mistake endless activity for accomplishment when it is not. The purpose of activity is to accomplish. And activity itself is no accomplishment in itself. It is exactly like learning also. To become learned is not important in itself. It is only the benefit of learning upon living that is important. The person who knows much and does little, does little has gained very little. So leisure or a contemplative condition is very important to us. Yet at the same time, those who have spoken of the dignity of leisure are criticized by the hurried. We can conceive of leisure today only as time-wasting. We are unfortunately unable to recognize the possibility of a rich, diversified leisure. 
we also are unable to recognize relief from responsibility as opportunity for leisure. To us, relief from responsibility is the end of life. When we are no longer under responsibility, there is nothing left for us to do but die genteelly. That all of these so-called negative things which cut us off uh, from duty or burden or relieve us from tasks which we have finished. These uh, so-called negative occurrences are actually invitations to the contemplative life for which man is particularly fitted in the closing third of his physical existence in time. Yet to us this leisure is not a blessing. It is a catastrophe. It only permits us to worry more and become more sorry for ourselves. Instead of being a, an inspiration to the enrichment of our inner living. Thus, without a contemplative life, we have no real bridge between spiritual conviction and conduct. Without the strength of the gradual maturing of our internal sense of values, we have no resources with which to combat the encroachment of crassness or materiality or unpleasantness in our environment. So we do recognize this tremendous virtue of contemplative living. The absolute need that every person has for at least brief periods of being alone with self and finding this condition agreeable. If we cannot get along with ourselves pleasantly, that is probably the clue to our trouble with other people. For we may expect them to get along with us more amiably than we can endure our own association. And this will fail because the beginning of our relation with others is the integration of our relation with ourselves. Now our particular problem this morning is the factor of immortality. Can we experience this? Can we know it? Can we lift ourselves from certain doubts and uncertainties about our own future to a condition of greater internal security? So let us ask the first question. Immortality appears to the average human being as a great hope, as a great value. Just how valuable is immortality to us unless we make certain changes within ourselves? How many persons really would like to go on forever the way they are now? <laughs> is the possibility of a continuance in eternity of the disposition we cannot get along with today. A continuance of the foolish mistakes which we daily and hourly make. The continuance of our self-pities and our fears and our worries and our anxieties. Would such continuance be a boon? Would it give us anything which we could look forward to uh, without a measure of alarm or a certain sense of disaster. Actually, therefore, immortality as a belief is not essentially satisfactory unless it is coupled with or associated with other strong and positive values. We must, in order to experience this truly, have the real pressing sense of the value of continuance. 
Now the value of continuance into eternity, of a life which we do not value now, would again be an uncertain achievement. The individual who is only looking forward to the end of life as a release from boredom could hardly regard immortality as a benefit. Now to meet this peculiar situation, we have various highly colored concepts of what immortality is like. Man as a psychological being has decided definitely that immortality as the continuance of the present state is not acceptable. Therefore he has developed various concepts of paradisios and purgatorios to take care of this. In other words, the life before him in eternity must either be better or worse. It must not and cannot be the same. Obviously, we would have very little to look forward to if we really believed in the existence of a purgatorial state uh, such as the theologians of long ago uh, so loudly proclaimed. Because according to their dicta and according to their laws, rules, and the very concepts with which they framed these perditions, we would all be in them. Because their, for them salvation was restricted to a very small group of special persons. On the other hand, the concept of the other world extending on into a magnificent vista of peace and glory and happiness <coughs> violates every concept of reasonable and lawful procedure that we know. The individual, not having solved anything, cannot hope to proceed by the mystery of death into a state of solution. He must continue to be himself, and his future life, his immortality, as the Chinese point out, is acceptable only to the degree that it is necessary. The Egyptians held that immortality uh, was reserved for those who needed it. We do not hold that thought today. But there is a certain point in it, from an ethical standpoint, that is highly intriguing. When the individual says here, I hate to lay down my instruments of labor, there is so much more to be done. There are so many things to learn, so many opportunities that I have never been able to uh, avail myself of. There are so many who need my help. There are so many who need my presence and instruction. I regret that I have to cease these labors. Such a person, according to the Egyptian, would be a likely candidate for immortality. Why? Because he not only needs to live to fulfill his own instincts, but he desires to live. It is not an expectation. A, an acceptance of a doctrine which makes continuance inevitable. It is a voluntary statement of the desire and need to go on. The Egyptian pointed out that such was the type of person to whom the gods might well bestow this blessing, because to this person it would be a blessing. He wants to go on. He wants to grow. He wants to learn. Like Socrates, he goes forth to a great adventure of further becoming. But where is this adventure? Where is all of this? If the individual here and now is in the doldrums, has no interest in anything, no sincere desire to forget himself in the service of something greater, and really has nothing to live for even here, why then should this blessing be a blessing? Would it not be rather a heavy burden upon him? So in order to meet this emergency, almost all of your religious groups 
and your great philosophical systems have tried to impel the individual or inspire the individual to so live now that immortality would be a natural right, a proper continuance of a procedure already well established, the opportunity of the individual to see the future as the unfolding of useful and desired experience, not merely further twiddling of fingers somewhere in an infinite Elysian field. That there is no reason, no purpose, in the individual attaining an extension of consciousness unless that extension is meaningful, purposeful, vital. We do not hold the old thought today we assume the natural immortality of all things. But one thing we can take from the old philosophy, and that is this very firm realization that whatever this continuance may be, it will be better if the individual is more purposeful. That if he has dreams and ideals, he then faces an opportunity for greater fulfillment. Whereas if he has none of these attitudes, he faces only continuance. And he can hardly endure that part of it which he now faces in this world. <clears throat> How then shall we say that man comes to the conviction of immortality? Man is bound in a very peculiar pattern. And one of his subconscious instincts seems to be that he realizes that he lives in a world in which all things that are necessary are available. Man observes nature's infinite economy, the wonderful way in which this life of ours is geared into numerous cycles and patterns. And man is convinced that nothing that he needs is unavailable to him. He must learn how to find what he needs, but it is somewhere available if his own understanding and his own consciousness can discover it. Therefore, the great need for immortality in the experience of the individual does a great deal to strengthen his belief in it. It gives him a sense of valid requirement. He makes his own proper request of nature by proving that his immortality will be of common good to himself and others. He therefore has the feeling, the expectancy within himself that this condition which he needs will not be absent from him. If he firmly, internally, visualizes life, that this visualization is authentic, that it states to him something that is so, and that he can believe firmly that what his heart and conscience tell him, these things are true. True because they come from roots and sources deep within himself. Immortality must be discovered within the person, but there is certain valid testimony relating to it around him. For example, dependent as we are upon the testimonies of our sense perceptions, <coughs> we live in a world of continual life, yet a world in which each creature seemingly and obviously passes through the mystery which we call death. Thus we can say that a collective such as our nation can continue for 200, 300, 500 years and yet there is no citizen within the structure of this state who can endure for that length of time. Thus we have two kinds of mortality and two kinds of immortality. We have the mortality of nations by which death is decreed 
to a political unit or to a social structure or to a racial group. But this death is not decreed immediately so that these people may live as a collective for a thousand, two thousand, five thousand years. Then we also have this other decreed fact that the individuals composing this compound may live only from 50 to perhaps a hundred years as individuals. Thus we have two kinds of life, the life of a collective and the life of an individual. We also recognize that this life of the collective carries with it many archetypal forms. This life of the collective is not without a common consciousness of itself that has a consciousness for its own language, for its own physical, biological peculiarities of color and temperament and bodily structure. It has a consciousness of its own arts, of its sciences, of its history and traditions, of its religions. These are all entities within the consciousness of the collective. So the motion of a race down through history is the motion of one valid structure of ideas. And in its thousand, two thousand, five thousand years of existence, a race passes from infinite infancy to childhood, from childhood to adolescence, from adolescence to maturity, from maturity to age, and from age to dissolution. This long cycle is actually the story of the birth and growth and decline of a consciousness. And at any moment in this process, this consciousness is composed of the individual units which make up the people of a generation. So we have this compound approach to immortality visible to us. We become aware, therefore, that forms, patterns, personalities are forever changing, but principles, lives, uh, concepts, ideals have a greater endurance and may pass through vast cycles of continuance, some of which we cannot fully estimate. We also then suddenly realize that the greatest cycle that we know is humanity and the human being. Humanity has been the unbroken descent of this creature we call man for millions of years. Safe to say that this descent in human form probably is not less than five to ten million years old, probably longer. And yet in this great descent of the collective, we find a stream of perishable individuals so that individuals come and go, but man goes on archetypally. Basic, the great human unit moves victoriously along a way scattered with the death of individuals. We have the same problem in connection with the human body. Man as a human being has an endurance of 70, 80, 90 years. Yet there are no cells in the body except perhaps a few of the most essential and deep-rooted of them, that has anything resembling such continuity. And there is an old belief, which is not so uh, untrue, that every part of the human body is renewed and replaced every seven years. So that every seven years we have a new body, whether we know it or not. And every living part of that body has passed through a cycle of birth and growth and maturity and death. Yet we go on. Yet were we bound by our perspective 
to measure our own life by the cell in our body, we would be constantly in the presence of death. Yet this death does not interfere with the grand motion of our consciousness for a number of years, giving us our span of three score or four score years. In these patterns, then, we become aware that behind ever-changing life and death, there is a continuance, a continuance which is valid, a continuance which ancient man recognized and which he incorporated into his great religio-philosophical institutions. A continuance in consciousness which is not broken by the interlude of death as we know it. If therefore in every visible institution and structure that we know Death relates only to an expression, a manifestation, a part. And life relates totally and eternally to all, to the totality of things. Then we must admit that death is an incident in the motion of life itself. That it is not an end. It is not a termination of life but an incident, an episode, a moving and changing pattern within life, which is an unchanging and eternal state. Man, by contemplation, begins to experience these things within himself. And we must therefore stop for a moment and ask about the validity of the personal experience of a spiritual value. Those of materialistic mind are inclined to feel that a so-called spiritual experience is little better than a self-hypnosis, that the individual longing and desperately desiring to believe forces this belief upon himself, and that therefore his consolation in spiritual believing is merely the consolation of an acquired attitude uh, with which he indoctrinates himself coming in the end to believe that which he cannot demonstrate or prove simply by the strength of his own mental emotional pressure his need for example causes him to formulate a solutional belief which is solutional to him <clears throat> but has no validity in space. This would be true and is true every day if the individual's faith or philosophy of life is based upon an aggressive self-indoctrination. There are persons every day who are accepting beliefs that are not so. And they are doing it because their own life is so poorly integrated and so completely lacking in depth and penetration that they have no criterion whatever with which to measure the value of anything. And furthermore, they are accepting beliefs out of desperation. They are accepting something as man might cling to a piece of broken wreckage in a shipwreck. Anything that offers perhaps a hope or a chance. Thus man turns to his faith only because of his own extremity. And in this extremity, as he founders along, sinking and derelict in this sea of values, he will naturally cling to things which are immediate and which seem to offer some solution especially without too much work on his own part. As opposed to this, however, is your contemplative religious life, in which the individual does not develop his convictions only in moments of emergency. 
but rather through the building of value, reduces emergency. Ninety percent of the emergencies which we pass through are not valid. A few may be, because man simply does not as yet possess sufficient faculties with which to cope with everything that happens to him. But he does possess faculties which will cope with nearly everything, leaving only a very rare and extraordinary valid emergency. For the rest, his emergency is due merely to his own unwillingness to make living a personal responsibility. His definite effort to evade life and evade solution, these are what causes trouble. So instead of building our concept of value under the hypnotic tension of necessity, we must build it under the contemplative leisure which has to do with our maturity as human beings. If through contemplative procedure man gradually permits value to move into his consciousness, he will find that his final conversion is not due to his mind converting the rest of him, Rather, it is due to the inner depths of his own nature converting his mind. Man as a being has the possibility of presenting to the mind itself an unsolvable riddle as far as mentality is concerned. I do not believe that the inner life of man can be solved by a totally rational procedure. Rationality, however, is the discipline by which man becomes capable of transcending the limitations of his own judgment. Without discipline, no one will ever achieve a true measure of internal understanding. And discipline is what bestows upon the person the opportunity for the tranquility of, the, of contemplative leisure. Discipline, for instance, can begin by placing the person in a pattern, self-determined, in which he arranges his affairs so that a certain amount of leisure is available to him, so that he does not tumble along through the day, merely a victim of the pressures of the moment, but approaches his problem with a plan. Discipline helps him to close the door of his office and come home without bringing his work home with him to worry about or to be fearful about. Discipline enables him to recognize the needs of certain uh, rights and privileges which his body demand, uh, demands, and also his family requirements, his recreations, and all of these uh, values. These he must achieve and maintain by discipline. The moment he became, begins to be indifferent to his own conduct, permitting excess to appear in some direction or other, whether it be the excess of idleness or the excess of overhaste, the moment excess destroys moderation, his contemplative life is ruined. So by contemplation, he gradually comes into a repose, a measure of tranquility, and begins to discover the tremendous potential strength of tranquility. He begins to discover that value is not always in the hectic accomplishment of something. It is in the ability to relax away from things and to find the dignity of quietude in relationship to value. In this way, through the gradual development of a leisure factor, man discovers that leisure is the beginning of learning, because through leisure the individual has time, and time is an essence of contemplation.
in our way of life. Without some time, we cannot cultivate the mature interests of our lives. And in deciding only to devote our time to the attainment or acquirement of material activities, we destroy the leisure and contemplative part of our lives. Without this leisure, man's inner life remains a mystery to him. And as long as this mystery endures, he is weak. If then we, then we can begin this contemplative procedure that gradually moves from within ourselves values which we cannot adequately define but which require no definition. I would say that wherever anything moves from within ourselves because of pressure, because of emergency, it can be distorted. And there are many times in which the impulses and instincts from within ourselves are not valid. They are not valid because they are the product of ulterior pressure in ourselves. In desperation, in emergency, we call upon our internal resources, but we call upon something undeveloped. And most of all, we impose upon it immediately that it shall fulfill our desire. Thus, when we pray, we pray for what we want. We'll, ref we'll refuse to accept anything else. We'll demand and decree that what we want, we shall have. And if we are in search of a believing at this time, we will impose upon ourselves that the thing we believe must be what we want to believe. It must be the fulfillment of a concept that justifies us. It must be the kind of internal conviction that is consistent with our demands upon life. Well, by the time we get through with all of these demands, all of these restrictions and reservations upon ourselves, what comes through is little better than a conditioned reflex. It seems to arise within ourselves, but it is nothing but the total statement of our own ignorance. It is merely our mind and our subconscious gratifying our objective consciousness saying amen because it has not permitted to say anything else. Agreeing because it must either agree or not be heard. And this type of message comes from a much lower level, for it is merely the coming out of our own frustrations. For the inner life of man is not merely a divine quality. It is also a tumbling ground for frustrations and neurotic pressures. If well, then, when we seek within ourselves, and we seek on the level of pressures, we are pressurefully demanding solution, we get pressureful solution. We get all these theories and all these believings that we have demanded. We do not get what is true. If, however, we enter into this communion with our inner life without imposing upon it ulterior motives of our own, if we are really truth-seeking and are not asking that the truth be what we expect it to be, but are perfectly willing to accept the divine purpose and abide by it, asking only to be shown enough so that we can keep the law and not make this law our servant. Gradually, through such an attitude, we begin to break down the psychotic errors, and the psychic pressures, and the psychosomatic tensions by which the internal vision, vision of man is deformed. One of the reasons why we have so many difficulties in our religious life is that we have mistaken 
neurotic pressure for divine revelation. We do it individually. We have done it collectively. We have created powerful world movements upon what is nothing more or less than the neurosis of a brilliant person. And as a result, those who have followed these ideas have themselves become more and more involved in difficult patterns. And such organizations and such groups do not prevent war, they do not prevent discord, they do not overcome intolerance, because they are burdened with these things themselves. The pure stream of revelation, as referred to in the ancient writings, was not permitted to manifest itself. We insisted upon a revelation that matched and met our predetermination as to what it was going to be. And moving as we did from tension, we had no possibility of experiencing anything but a tense doctrine. I have known these things and watched them happen over periods of years. An individual with a natural tendency to intolerance presses upon his internal life demanding support. And before he gets through, he has a complete revelation justifying intolerance. In fact, commanding it as a divine responsibility not knowing that the whole pattern came out of himself. But he was sincerely convinced that his own attitudes were a full expression of the divine purpose. Searching within himself with this attitude, he found nothing but support for his own attitude, because nothing else would have been acceptable to him, nothing else would have been recognized. So if you go in toward yourself, inward, with preconception as to what you will find, you will always find what you expect. The uh, Taoist philosophers of China realized this, and therefore said that the only way that we can find truth, either around us or within us, is to live totally without preconceived expectancy. The moment we expect nothing, the fact is available. The moment we truly depart from attempting to direct and determine the universal method, we become aware of the true working of that method. As long as we are looking for something, we will find nothing else. And unfortunately, we cannot look for a platitude. The individual says, I seek only truth. Yet he cannot define truth without conditioning it with his own attitudes. The pure, complete, impersonal substance of truth is inconceivable to him. Truth must therefore be the faith he was brought up in, or the faith he has accepted, or the result of his own experience, or his own empirical conclusion. Truth cannot be something completely separate and apart from his own attitude. Therefore, the search for truth is in most cases merely the search for self-justification. There is no other way we can pattern it. For these reasons and uh, others similar, we find the validity of the Buddhistic attitude, namely that man, in order to discover true value in anything, must overcome the value-defining factor in himself. He must open himself to pure value. And to do this, he must cease conditioning value. Psychology will tell you that by certain catharsis, 
man can rid himself of the pressure of certain complexes. Unfortunately, however, he no more than rids himself of one before he develops another. For these are like the, the, the dragon whose heads multiplied as quickly as they were cut off. Consequently, it is almost impossible to conceive of a person whose internal life is completely without false pressures. Almost inconceivable that such a person could exist. Therefore, in philosophy, our primary purpose is to reduce as far as we can these false pressures by giving the individual a kind of outlook on life in which he is no longer limited by that kind of ignorance which makes him selfish, unkind, or self-pitying, jealous, hateful. Under the understanding that if we understand the universe well enough, we can no longer sustain our own unpleasant actions. We must outgrow them by understanding through them to something better. Always these reductions of pressure. If a man through his religion, his philosophy, or his scientific approach to life, or through his social context, through his business, through his family, whatever it may be, if a human being can, through these associations, learn to overcome hate, so that he no longer hates anything. A tremendous source of error within himself has been dissipated. He will then no longer desire or accept a God of hate. He will no longer believe that the fulfillment of his life depends upon the discomfiture of someone else. Nor can he any longer believe in these various dishonesties which are rising from hate plague him continuously and cause him to resent living. If then by any means contemplative or mystical we reduce false values we begin to experience a broader sense of true values. We know this is true in religion. We have a complete historical record of its truth. For well, we know that the faiths of primitive men, who had less internal contemplative skill than we have, were correspondingly literal. That in ancient times men worshipped much in fear, worshipped deities very much like their physical objective selves, worshipped a god who was little more than a tribal chieftain. Because when they sought within themselves, these were the things they found, and they had to worship according to what they could experience. Man must always worship this way. Consequently, the increasing need for man to have a more valid experience. And he has resources today which will permit him to search within himself and if he will develop his contemplative powers of leisure and tranquility, he can begin to experience the valid fact of a universal divine principle embodying the highest attributes of wisdom and love. These things he can now contemplate if he permits himself but if he hates, he can never know love. And the individual who hates a human being can never know divine love. The individual whose concept of knowledge is so false that it is deficient in essential wisdom can never experience divine wisdom. Man cannot experience that which he does not know. And although it is hard to believe it, actually man does know more than he realizes. 
and he cannot contemplate some virtue unless he possesses the seed of it in his own nature. Thus man, desiring and recognizing the importance of brotherhood, does so because he has it within himself, and therefore that it is available if he knows how to bring it into manifestation. In our thinking, therefore, man's experience or conscious knowing of immortality must arise from the complete overshadowing or overwhelming of death by life itself. <clears throat> the individual must move gradually and contemplatively into a limitless universe a universe of infinite life in infinite manifestation, a universe of continual growth, continual unfoldment, a universe in which no one can find a principle of death. The individual to find this universe of life must realize that life and death theoretically arise from a kind of definition of value. Actually, reality can never die. Therefore, reality and immortality have a common ground. Error is forever dying. Therefore, error and death have a common ground. The individual who relentlessly forces a certain attitude comes as Mussolini or Hitler or Napoleon did to the point where this attitude causes their own destruction. Ambition leads but to the grave. And we find that excess of any kind is fatal. We observe also that the only thing we ever have to change within our own nature is our mistake. We must outgrow it and correct it. But what we have done right from the beginning, we will continue to do right, and it will be immortal. Therefore, all things that are so, that are real, are true, are factual, have about them the quality of an eternal value. Whereas everything about which we are uncertain, in conflict, or about which we have inadequate knowledge, or lack strength of conviction, in these things there is death, because there must be change. We must outgrow a fault, therefore a fault can die. But we can never outgrow a true virtue, because it is immortal. We can outgrow all our concepts of deity because our concepts are inadequate. But deity, as a basic value, we cannot outgrow. So we are always finding a greater immortality in realities. And we are also observing more distinctly and definitely the mortality of error. These things which are not so cannot live, and death is forever dividing man from things he likes which are not so, and he leaves them with regrets because he has not yet sufficient contemplative integration in truth. If then in this season of the year we are searching for a positive identification with value, we realize that religion is a value, that it is a great and tremendous need in man. But up to the present time, the full statement of religion has not been available to man. Because up to now, every religion has to some measure been creedal. And every religion has certain reservations about other religions. Consequently, we have still to attain the true spirit of religion. 
But this spirit will not be imposed upon us by sectarian emphasis or by the rise of cults or by new creeds. True religion is the power of man's own consciousness to penetrate appearances and differences and discover value. And each person at this stage of our evolution must make this discovery for himself. And the moment he does so, he has a new sense of strength, a new value, which can support him through the long years of life. Religion must then always be not an unconditioned acceptance, for if it is an unconditioned acceptance, it means the individual has not thought, has not really bestowed himself upon his idea. It must be recognized as a more or less conditioned acceptance, in which the individual still reserves the right to grow, still reserves the right to continue to improve, and by improving, to discover a continually increasing religious value. His religion will always lead him, for as he grows, each new development of his own nature will bring him further into the mystery of faith. Man does not outgrow religion. He outgrows creeds. He outgrows doctrines. But he never outgrows the need for the internal experience of eternity. He never outgrows the need, as far as he can conceive at this time, of the infinite universe of value, which is accessible to him only through his own contemplative life. In this season, then, in which we have uh, a sacred restoration of value in our lives. The concept of a world ruled over by a sovereign good, the desire deep and strong within us that we shall, in the due course of time, as our own growth and unfoldment permits, be able to proclaim peace on earth and goodwill to all men. But sometime we can do this. Why? Because this concept is stronger and more immortal than our concept of war, hate, and discord. In ourselves we believe in peace, but we have never been able to visualize it or achieve it because we have not been able to integrate a dynamic of it in our own conduct. We know that it is true, and then we say, but I cannot apply it. We are like uh, the story of Paul, who would forever do good, but evil was nigh unto him. We would do these things if we could, but the moment we want to live these principles, some temptation that is too strong comes along. Or we have disappointed in something, and some secondary tragedy blocks in us the attainment of primary good. We have allowed some value that is not important to destroy for us the significance of a value that is important. From the beginning, therefore, men have asked how. And by what means shall we transfer this universal conviction of peace on earth and goodwill to men, transfer it from the, the substance of things hoped for to the more tangible substance of things accomplished? How are we going to do it? Actually, you cannot say there is a one, two, three, four, five process in this. There is no formula by which man can inevitably and automatically bring about this state. There is no way in which a nation or a government could set up a pattern by which this would be inevitable. There are disciplines through the use of which 
the probabilities of these things can be tremendously increased. But it is true of all of the spiritual attainments of man because of factors we do not understand that these attainments rest in the keeping of eternal wisdom and that the time of their fulfillment is a mystery in God and the hour no man knoweth. But these disciplines do help if we wish to apply them. Actually, however, this problem of how are we going to transfer a beautiful conviction and make it into a dynamic fact, how are we going to do this, is not a matter of formula or of mechanism or of some trick or some device which can be whispered or communicated to us or read out of our favorite author. These things are not valid in this case. Actually, peace on earth and goodwill to men is here now. It is everywhere. But man himself will not permit it to express. Therefore, the only solution is for the individual to get out of the way of value. And he does this by removing the obstruction to it in his own consciousness. He cannot create peace because peace is eternal. He does not create goodwill because goodwill is eternal. And the moment error or false value ceases, all these values will blaze out in their eternal beauty. The individual is locking them by the negative attitudes of his own existence. That is why contemplation is so valuable and why the meditative life, the life of leisure, is so useful to us. It is that part of our existence in which we settle down very quietly to getting out of our own way we proceed gradually to reduce pressure. In contemplation and in true leisure, we are not driven by anything. We are not even driven by the bill collector. He may be along tomorrow, but in that moment of leisure, we are free from him. If we are provident, we are provided for him. If we are improvident, we must do better. But in the moment of leisure, we are trying to find value in order that this value may in its own way make us more provident, will make all things more uh, proper and normal. For it's very possible that the bill collector is only there because we have foolishly bought things we neither needed nor wanted, merely under pressure. So it will either help us to meet him when he comes or else prevent him from coming in the first place if we begin to integrate our lives. In either event, there is a lawful solution and not merely an effort to escape him. He is there because of our conduct. And therefore, he cannot be evaded. But we can reorganize our conduct so that his coming will not be a dilemma. If then in our conduct we achieve leisure, achieve tranquility of consciousness, we shall then discover that these things that we want, we do not have to create. If it was up to man to create life, create virtue, create wisdom, create truth, he would be in a sad way indeed. But he is not required to do these things. They have always existed. Any more than he was required to create his own life. The consciousness, the life in, in, within him is not created by himself. But it must be sustained and perfected through his effort. 
And in the same way, all good things that man needs are available. They have been created. But man must learn to use them and apply them properly to the ends which are necessary and right. Through contemplation, therefore, the person suddenly discovers the availability of values which he needs. There is no elaborate procedure. There is simply man relaxing away from falseness. And whether he relaxes away from it or is finally pried loose from it is up to himself. He must separate from it. If he chooses to separate, this separation is a pleasant, gentle, beautiful experience for him because he is doing it by intention and because he values something else more. But if he insists on remaining non-factual to the bitter end, struggling and finally sinking with his own errors, he will have a dismal and discouraging time. But this is his decision and not the decision of the universe. The universe has nothing to do with it. No uh, angry deity is punishing him. No outrageous society is afflicting him. He is just declining to change his ways. Therefore, he is going down with the ways he is clinging to. Not because he has to, but because he has chosen to. And he has chosen to unless he chooses not to. There is no other possible approach to these problems. So it is quite conceivable that man, through a quiet use of the values which he possesses, can inevitably come to decisions which will place him in a state of comparative security, realizing always that this security has nothing to do with what other people do. It has to do with our own internal relation. But if this relation is proper, it almost certainly improves the environmental conditions because we become easier to work with, more gracious, more charming, more intelligent, more grateful, and these are the kinds of attitudes which inspire other people to be of greater value to us. It is all a natural procedure pointing out that nature has a way of rewarding that which is right because the rightness of the individual inevitably reaches into the rightness in other individuals. And our archetypal acceptance of truth forces us to recognize it wherever it appears. And while we may argue against it, may ignore it, still internally we know it. And we also internally respect the individual who practices it. So immortality is this discovery within ourselves, a discovery which we can make and which once made reverses the entire psychology of our lives. Instead of creating immortality, we accept it. Instead of fighting to prove it, which is a profitless task, we are still and know it because it comes from roots so deep that it is part of the common heritage of the collective life principle which we all share. From the dawn of man's beginnings, men have believed with something strange and fervent within themselves. They have believed in the divinity of their own destiny. They have believed that there is a power which moving all things is impelling them toward truth, toward life, toward reality, and that everything contrary is of appearances. And if we sit down and begin to study history as a philosophy, or we study anthropology as a philosophy, we come more and more into the obvious facts that between every race, every generation, every tribe and clan, and the better time they looked for, there was nothing but their own ignorance.
at any time. That there was no great big false world that had to be fought. There was selfishness in man which prevented him from permitting the truth to be made known. Not the selfishness in others, but the selfishness in ourselves, which locked our power to experience value. And because we could not experience, we remained weak. And because we were weak, we were destroyed by other cultures. We were swept away, and great centuries of progress were leveled with war and destruction. All of these things because the individual in himself could not experience eternity as life and love and truth. He simply lacked the power. Most of all, he lacked this industry by means of which he could make this power available to himself. And religion, instead of making this power immediately available to him, imposed upon him so many restrictions of an intellectual nature that he began to demand that truth look like the very faith he belonged to. And by dividing truth, therefore, into 49 different religions, truth became like the one-piece robe of the Messiah for which the soldiers cast their lots. And in the breaking up of this unity of faith, man destroyed the unity of life in his own consciousness. Psychologically, he began to believe in real gods and false gods. And he was for and against. And this great structure of Aristotelian polarized thinking came into existence. If one thing is good, something different must be bad. And so, by degrees, he lost the simplicity, the integrity of realizing that all error belongs to man and all reality belongs to the infinite. And then bridging across from his own smallness toward reality, man gained his own greatness, the greatness of his acceptance, the greatness of his power to experience. Any human being who is capable of attaining honest quietude, honest tranquility, who is capable of dividing the things of this world from the things of eternity, who is willing to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto truth and to God, those things which belong to truth and God, and will place the search for reality in its own peculiar place as the supreme purpose of human life and will cultivate even a little contemplative life will begin to find the enrichment of larger and more complete understanding. He will never find it necessary to prove immortality because he will move into a way of consciousness in which nothing else is conceivable and in which consciousness itself will not permit unbelief or disbelief. We can reject the opinion of anyone. We can declare any doctrine heretical. But no individual can move against the complete impact of his own internal consciousness. He has no refuge from it. The only way he can deny it is to lock himself in an error or lock himself in a fixation or a neurosis which will not permit him to face it. But the moment he turns again to face his own reality, he must face the full impact of it. And this is not a terrible impact, but a very gentle one. It is the simple acceptance, the permission which we give for the mind and the emotions and the body to become instruments of real value rather than slaves of our notions and opinions. It is a simple thing in itself 
talking about it sounds terribly difficult. But it is just as simple as man going to sleep. For in sleep, man gradually casts off doubt and fear and enters into a state of receptivity toward life. If he does not achieve this, he does not sleep. Therefore, man is awake with fear, but he must sleep in a state of faith. There is no other way he can. He must sleep with acceptance. He must accept sleep. He cannot demand it or command it. But he will discover that if he does not provide within himself certain conditions, sleep is not so likely to come to him. But just as sleep is a peace coming to him in silence, so in a way reality is a peace coming to man in silence. He cannot force it. He can do many things to prevent it. But if he keeps the pattern of life, it will happen to him because it is intended that it should happen. And it is inevitable that man, reaching a degree of growth, shall experience the strength of internal support. This support is his in eternity. It is his inevitable and immortal birthright. And when he receives it, when it comes to him, he does not question it. He does not doubt it, because he finds in it the ever-present help, the ever-present security and strength with which to make all decisions well, and to do all things with true nobility of purpose. He must, however, actually be able to achieve this strange renunciation, which the mystics and the religious of all ages have talked about, this power to be free, at least in the contemplative hour, free from the world. Free from the world in the sense, not that we escape it or evade it or avoid it, but that we set up a sanctuary in the midst of it. There is nothing more disastrous than the commercialization of a faith, of a religion. There is nothing more tragic for man than his inability to separate his spiritual values from his objective responsibilities. He is not to reject these responsibilities. He is not to say that it is not necessary for him to make a living. But he must not have only these material pressures, nor must he permit himself to satisfy his spiritual need merely by pressing harder on his material activities. It will never work. The thing that will survive and will succeed is that he becomes capable of a voluntary renunciation of objective values for a little time, each day or whenever the opportunity arises in the effort in that time to establish his citizenship in eternity, his effort to establish his true relationship with truth. For as this relationship grows, it solves every other problem. It is not that he is merely here to make a living. Why should he live if only economic necessity drives him on? The reason he is here is to experience, and he must pay a certain cash fee in our society for the right of being a member of an experiencing body. But unless consciousness makes this experience valuable, nothing has been gained by labor, time, or wealth. Therefore, the need to consummate this struggled gaining that we have made. We have worked hard to create some values in our objective daily living, to meet responsibilities, to serve others, to raise families. These things we have worked to accomplish. These are valuable things, but they are not the real reason we are here. 
We are here to learn from the doing of these things eternal lessons about ourselves and about the universe in which we live. Our purpose here is to find the law's governing value so that every physical task that we perform becomes a valuable textbook or a symbol of a spiritual truth which we must contemplate and explore. We have no solution to our physical living except in the level of our spiritual integrity. And so life drifts on an endless cycle of disasters and disorders until man, through a contemplative focus within himself, accepts the power of reality over life and begins to live under law instead of lawlessly. With these concepts, we experience also immortality. For we discover that when we are one with what is true, we have an eternity with that truth. And the only thing about us that can die is the error in us. And the reason we can physically die is because of the interval between our spiritual nature and our physical or corporeal constitution. And it is conceivable that as man destroys the psychological interval between himself and truth, that the span of his life may be greatly lengthened because he is killed not by necessity but by law-breaking, by his own ignorance, by the tensions and pressures which he either cannot or does not prevent. Today he probably cannot prevent them because of the tremendous complex of interrelated values with which he must struggle. But as growth moves man collectively toward this concept of peace on earth and goodwill to men, when a spirit of truth is born in us, as symbolized by the nativity in Bethlehem, when reality becomes the supreme ruler of our world, when love and not hate become the custo becomes the custodian of value for us, and we cease breaking the emotional and mental laws governing human function, it is quite possible that we shall be rewarded by the end of sickness, the end of sorrow, and the extension of life far beyond anything that we know today, and probably most certainly the transition from one state to another will be peaceful and painless and perfectly normal. These things can come when man understands, but they will not come until the individual places value above his own opinion. So in this Christmas season, let us try to recognize that an eternal, ever-present love wisdom abides forever in us and around us, but that it cannot come to us as experience until we relax, until we let down the barriers of our own opinions, until we ourselves, through a contemplative and peaceful nature, create a spiritual atmosphere in which this mystery can be known to us. The star shines, but we must have in our power to see it. And we cannot see it while we are locked in opinions of sorrow and misery. So by relaxation and peace, we experience now the fact of immortality. Whereas in our troubled states, even with all our sciences and our arts, we can never solve the mystery of life. It must be solved out of man's own understanding, his own peace of consciousness, released through an ordered life, a life brought into a worshipful state of receptivity in which the great sacraments of the universe can be bestowed freely and fully upon a receptive 
humankind. And in those mysteries, we have the mystery of faith and the mystery of fulfillment. The man comes in the end to the true religious spirit, the religious experience, which we all seek so desperately to capture at this season in particular because of its strong relation to the faith of our people and our time. And so, friends, we thank you very much and uh, wish for you all these good things. May I take this opportunity of expressing the deepest appreciation to all of you for your attendance during the past year and to the friends here who have helped and who supply the flowers and the music and the book table services and everything for their many kindnesses and sacrifice in our behalf and those who sell the tickets and those who do the ushering and help with the books and always we appreciate their thoughtfulness and I'm sure that you appreciate it also. I would like to further make the announcement that this afternoon at headquarters our PRS Center study group will meet at two o'clock to discuss the subject lecture of this morning. All who are interested in further discussion of this material or group discussion of it are invited to attend as guests of the uh, study group and of the society. I have here the program for our next series of lectures. It will be published and will be available to you if possible. Uh, you will receive it through the mail in the next few days. But for your convenience, we will reopen our series of lectures here on Sunday, January 12th. And uh, the first subject will deal with the problem of a dynamic conviction and how it can change daily living. In the early part of the next program, we will also give our series of forecasts for the next year. Also, our class activities will begin at headquarters on uh, Wednesday evening, January 15th. And our first series of five lectures will be, ter will be entitled The Cycle of the Phoenix. And in this we are going to approach the philosophy of history. And with uh, the uh, emphasis upon the great cyclic returns of historical events. So we hope that you will be interested in these lectures and the lectures of the other uh, teachers on our seminar program. I'd like to also point out that you can still secure last-minute Christmas gifts or booklets at our book table, and we believe that the records, perhaps, especially the record on our philosophy of life, might be valuable at this time. Also, the Christmas booklet can still be used for last-minute Christmas gifts. In connection with the subject of this morning, I'd like to also mention our book, The Twelve World Teachers, which perhaps will help us to get rid of one pressure in our lives that makes contemplation difficult, and that is the pressure of interreligious prejudice. These things would help considerably. If your names and addresses are not on our mailing list, will you be very kind enough to give them to us so that we can notify you or your friends of our approaching season of activities? And we thank you all and wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and that next year will be one in which the contemplative values of living will begin to shine through brightly like a star, making our lives richer and giving us a fuller understanding of the eternal truths in which we live forever. We must discover them by simply accepting them into our lives. And the best of greetings to you all and God's blessing for the coming year.